Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the class tonight. Thanks for uh, joining us and watching this uh, recording. We are still in uh, our study of Romans. Uh, we have been involved for a uh, few sessions now at the first part of of Romans, uh, being chapters 1 and 2 and even going into 3 because we've said that chapters 1 and 2 culminate in Paul's statements in chapter 3, not only showing the the, the issue, the problem of sin and death, whether Jew or Gentile, the the internal condition of depravity and corruption that overrides every external distinction, even a God-ordained external distinction, because that external distinction that God himself ordained, being Jew and Gentile, was not meant to give identity to uh, natural men. It was meant to be a temporary testimony of a division that God would bring about in finality through the work of the cross. It was never to perpetuate a natural distinction between a Jew or a Gentile. It was actually the Jew being in God's sight a representation, a, a testimonial aspect of his son, Israel is my son, and all that flows out of that statement, the Jew, all of it, everything God does from that moment up to, up to that moment and after that moment is him utilizing a people that he created out of humanity itself, out of isolating one aspect of humanity himself, itself to testify of a perfect son, a, a, a sinless, perfect son, his beloved. So that's what we've been talking about, but Paul's point is the whole issue that men have gravitated toward of Jew and Gentile and I will put this on the board just once again just to um, refresh our memory here. Jew and Gentile and this division that we talked about I think last week, this vision actually Paul defines it now as the law contained in commandments. And that was a division God gave for a moment in time until, he will say in Galatians 3, the law was until the seed should come because the whole issue here with the Jew and the Gentile, even a Jew under the law, a Gentile without the law, a Jew who boasts in having the law and glories and boasts in their righteousness attained seemingly by that law there is an underlying issue that dominates the whole picture regardless of Jew or Gentile, regardless of external law, regardless of righteousness is, regardless of observations and rituals regardless of it, there's an internal condition and it has to do with the seed, it has to do with a particular kind to whom this Jew, this Gentile, these vessels, fleshly, earthen, external vessels, are forever bound. I say forever because that is the case unless a divine work imposes of God is imposed upon this situation to break this bond, to loose this chain, to change the internal condition once and for all. Because this is a, t a condition that although they glory in their external law and they are condemned by these because they don't have such a law, it doesn't matter. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why? Because all 
Jew or Gentile, before they are born again, before they are, uh, when they are born of their mother, born of the seed of their father, which ultimately this is the father of all men. When they are born of this seed, the issue is the seed. The, the issue is always the corruption from within. So God's idea was not to perpetuate this, it was to bring them to something greater that does not have either of these earthly, external, superficial distinctions as its measure, but an internal measure that is spirit, an eternal measure that is perfect and holiness embodied, righteousness personified. And that's what he has done through the work of new birth. And I put the cross there not as an afterthought, but as the very means, the door by which this Great salvation that we now partake of in Christ has come to us. We have been partakers of an altogether complete, sufficient work. Christ himself, Christ in you, or there is neither. Jew or Gentile. But it's what? Christ all. In all. Showing all of this comes from one man to another. That's what we've been exposing here. That's what we've been talking about. Today, what I want to do, and I'm not promising to uh, complete this thought because this is something really new that I'm looking at. Something that I have been uh, focused on for a couple of days now in study. And it is... I sat and I read through the Arthur S. Way translation of uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. And I see so many parallels, and it shouldn't shock us, of course. I mean, Paul, Paul writes these letters and he declares the same reality to the people, to the, to the body. And I want to get into Colossians with you for a moment not to go away from our study in Romans because I believe this will further clarify where we are in Romans and especially as we proceed out of these first chapters keep in mind what we've been saying since chapter 5 through 8 and we're still in 8 but take all of that into consideration and then we come back to where we're looking at this righteousness fulfilled in us this reality of not being in the flesh but being in the spirit if the spirit of God the spirit of life dwells in us that being the only condition the only caveat for that to be true regarding the soul not being in the flesh but being in the spirit this is not about characteristics external things this is not about things you did. Oh, yesterday you were in the flesh and today you're in the spirit. That's not, not, that's not how that's defined. Flesh and spirit is defined here. Of the earth, earthy. The fleshly man. The man who is of the flesh. The man who is, who, who is the first man. Of the earth, earthy. The second man who is the Lord from heaven. Who is a life-giving spirit. Or you can say the very spirit of life a spirit of life that Paul now declares in Romans 8 has made him free from a law of sin and death and we can say it another way with the authority of Romans chapter 7 has made me free from the first husband to whom I was married that caused my that, 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 that made it impossible for good fruit to ever be born for good fruit to ever be produced, but always produced fruit unto death. That's true of the Jew and the Gentile. That's why on the heels of that statement concerning the first husband, a marriage to that first husband, being bound to him, and the necessity of him dying. And we talked about all that. God removed the whole edifice of the law in the cross and he removed that divisive thing and we could talk about that go into the temple in the Old Testament where they had a partition built 
where the Gentiles could only go so far. And there was an inscription on that wall, that, that partition that was built. I mean, it was a beautiful courtyard made with marble and everything, but there was a wall that separated the Gentile from going beyond a point to where it could not participate or partake of anything the Jew had as their right given by God. Why? Because this was declared to the Jew first. But it's a picture. Here's Paul is alluding to that in a way. He's alluding to that partition. Because on that partition there was inscribed a warning to not go any further under penalty of death. Under penalty of death. God, through the work of the cross, in this whole, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about the whole of the act of the cross. All of the things surrounding it, what he did, how he summed things up, here's what he did. He took this dividing wall, this partition that was for a moment in time, testimonial was not concrete. It was not eternally set by God to be something that was forever there. It was for a moment in time. But Christ removed that wall, that partition, which was the law containing commandments. He consolidated both Jew and Gentile in one body. On the tree. Why? Because he exposed the whole thing as one man of sin. One man. God didn't have to deal with the Jews and the Gentiles. He dealt with one man of sin. One man corruption was, his, was the source. He dealt with the source that both Jew and Gentile partook of through birth. The corruptibility of one man, he dealt with it by putting that man away and freeing the souls bound to this first man to be married to another. Putting it all on the same level. At that moment, before new birth, after the cross, and before the cross, but now, after the cross, done, adjudicated, final judgment. Dead. Dead in sin. The grace of God cries out to the souls in such death. Calls out like a trumpet. calls out like Christ calls out to Lazarus. That they may come, hear his voice and live. Come unto this other man, be born of another seed because this whole arrangement given of God, of course, that's, not, that's undeniably so. But for a moment, until the seed should come because the whole issue again was seed. The whole issue was seed. Now that soul dead in sin, called by the grace of God, called and worked on by the Spirit, drawn by the very power of grace itself, can be married to another, can be born of an incorruptible seed, and therefore be married to the perfect man. Be joined to, united with a man who does not have any sin in him. We're talking about the moment of new birth we immediately come to participate in and partake of a salvation without sin. Because the source has changed. The seed is different. 
We come from corruption to incorruption. We come from mortal to immortal. We come from death unto life. And that's, that's the basis upon which this letter to the Colossians stands. He's saying the same thing in this letter. And I want to point out a few things. We may at some point in time get into it a little, a little more, a little deeper. But I want to point out a few things that are interesting to me and show how the same thing is being said here. And you also have to go back to the last class. You can go back to my last podcast session if you want and see how this is dealt with with the whole taking away of the partition, redeemed, uh, reconciled by the cross uh, in one body, making one new man who is now at peace with God. Why? Because there's nothing in this man. Nothing in this man. The new man. The man who is my very life now by new birth. The man who is my righteousness by new birth. The man who is in me as the all of God's delight. The intention of God embodied and fully realized. That's who's in us by new birth. Immediate. Immediately. That's the basis of this. But there is also an issue that Paul has to deal with in this letter, just like he does with the Galatians, just like he's having to do with the Romans and other places as well. He's having to deal with this idea of performance. Performance. A work that we must do an addition that we must bring a bring to further solidify the reality of salvation to make it more concrete than it is and that stems from a standpoint of ignorance it stems from a true Ignorance with regard to the completeness that we've been talking about this whole time. The work of the cross, the reconciliation, the true once and for all work that has been wrought in Christ Jesus and that we have partaken of through our union, our being in, being born of the seed of Christ. So that's what I want to talk about just for a moment. Again, this is just a new consideration that I think helps out our look in, in Romans. As I was reading the Arthur S. Way translation, I was, uh, I was struck by his preface. He gives a uh, preface concerning this letter to the Colossians, as he does with most of the letters that he translates. But he gives this pre uh, preface of who was addressed and why was the letter written. And I won't read the whole thing, but, you know, there's been debate throughout the centuries about what heresy was Paul dealing with in this letter. And many, some will say Gnosticism, some will say other types of heretical teachings. But I think it's obvious when you read it that we're talking about the same issue that we're dealing with in Galatians. We're dealing with people who, by, who have been infiltrated by... Uh, Judaizers who are attempting to get these people who have who have believed in Christ, who have come from the from death unto life, who have fully put their trust in the person and work of Jesus. These Judaizers are now coming in, infiltrating their their church, imposing righteousnesses by the law external observation, rituals given of God at one point in time for a testimonial purpose, but pushing on them the need for these external things. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying um, there was a need for self-abasement, asceticism, that's what they were telling them. Um, now he gets off into some things I, I don't agree with, trying to add making the Gnostics add the Judaistic uh, features with it, and I don't think that's true. But 
he says various features of ritual and restrictions of Judaism were introduced in order to equip these fancies or these concepts, these ideas that they were having with a working system of outward observances. A working system of outward observances. That's that phrase stood out to me as I read that. A working system of outward observances. A working system. What does that mean? It means a system that actually brings about the, the thing in its completion. It's a working system. It's a workable thing. It's something that that is manufactured that gives us the ability that manufactures the steps to provide the result that we believe God is after. That's a working system. Everything's in an order. You do it according to that order and you get the result. But the problem is through the work of the cross in Christ, the result has already come. The result is already there. Paul's going to say that in this letter, building up to this warning that he's going to give them. And that's the whole point. Paul is basing, we've said this many times, in every letter, Paul bases every warning he gives or bases his prayer for them to comprehend what God has done upon a reality that is concretely settled and absolute in Christ. And therefore... If Christ is in you, absolute in the soul that is born of that seed that has Christ abiding within. He makes it real. He makes it so. And here's the point. He makes it effectual. The confusion comes in when we attempt to define effectualness or efficacy and we we define efficacy with tangibility. Now listen to me close. There is a desire for tangibility that flies directly in the face of a spiritual conclusion. Because all we have done in our millennium, in our millenniums of Christianity and Christian religion is invented so many tangibles, so many tangible validating proofs. And we, when that one fails, this one is invented. When that one fails, this one's invented. Some will still hold to this one. Others will hold to the second one. And then some will hold to this new one. And it goes on and on and on. And we've seen the result of that. Denominations, religions, all of these different concepts, ideologies that are out there today. And mostly it is for one reason. And that is to give the desired external, tangible proof of what God has already wrought internally. And we have yet to see the true evidence. We have missed the truth concerning our soul's condition. That's why most believers today live in a roller coaster ride of an experience they call salvation when the whole reality does not have ups and downs. It is once and for all, it is perfect, it is settled, it is a restful condition of a soul found and anchored in a perfect man. That's what we've come to. It, <coughs> it is this God awful desire and expectation for external tangible ma uh, manifestations, external tangible proofs that give some type of proof to an inward wrought work. We've already said this so many times. When Paul was a Jew still in Adam yet under the law, he boasted in a tangible righteousness, a tangible thing. He had so many tangible tangible proofs that he could point to, you could not at any point in time prove to him that he was wrong. He believed with his whole heart he was doing these things in God's, under God's provision and God's blessing. And he could point to many, many things and he points to them in his letters. And when he points to them in his letters, he shows 
that these things at one time were valuable. They were gained. These tangibilities gave me my identity. They showed me and showed the world and showed these especially who I condemned. They showed that I was holy and I was righteous and that I was a man of God and I was a true believer. But internally, there was still the issue of sin, death, corruptibility. And here's the point. Righteousness externally exhibited according to Paul, according to his external observations, was never, ever exhibited. Righteousness was never exhibited by a circumcised Jew. Righteousness was never exhibited. Not true righteousness. Testimonially, yes, for a moment in time. I'm talking about the truth. A righteousness, Paul will say, is now fulfilled in me because that's where righteousness has to finally be fulfilled, right? That's where it has to be finally, perfectly fulfilled. Because we're not talking about the acquiring of things. We're not talking about achieving enough where we can say, finally it's done. No, it's from one to another, automatic and immediate. When this was our state, unrighteousness was the condition. This is our state, being born of God. Righteousness is the condition because the righteous one now stands in us, being made unto us. All spiritual things. Made unto us righteousness in its perfect, most effective form. And that is spirit. Spirit. Nothing external could ever prove sin, nor could it prove righteousness. Because we look at this Jew, Paul will talk about himself in Romans 7 while still married to the man who makes his fruit corruptible regardless of his external actions and rituals and observances. doesn't matter. The inward result was always the same because it was always according to the source. The inward condition is according to source, not according to external observations and rituals and works and actions. So they were being... It, they, were, they were being influenced by these people who were introducing them to what seemed to be a working system of Judaistic observations and saying, if you will implement these things, then you will achieve the righteousness of God. You will, reach, you will achieve spiritual life in its full. But I'm always taken back to what Paul says about people like this. They're after you not because they truly love you, not because they truly are after you to grasp hold of the reality of salvation. No, they just want to be able to glory in your flesh. They want to boast in the fact that you are submitted to their particular bent, their particular invention. So, let's go on. But that's really important. Because that phrase is like a snapshot of an epidemic that's in Christianity today. And this again is the whole basis of this letter. He's writing to believers. He's writing to the church. He's writing to people who have come to reality in its fullness, come to Christ, complete in him. He'll say all these things. Who have Christ within them as the very intention of God, the expectation of God realized. And he's having to declare to them the absurdity of of looking to the externals to try to further what God has already wrought internally. What God has already done. What God has already wrought. Now yes, we'll get to the place where he says that about set your affection, but that's based upon the reality of being where they are. 
and the condition that they are now partakers of because of where they are, or we could say in whom they are found. That they have been risen with Christ, are now dead to sin, dead to the world because they're in him. Because where one man once determined sin and death as their condition, now one man determines their condition in an entirely different way. So now he says, I give thanks, this is Paul, and I'm going to read some of this in the Author S. Way translation. Some aspects of it. Verse 3. This again in Colossians chapter 1. I give thanks always to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, in all my prayers for you. And I have done so ever since I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love which you bear to all his consecrated ones, or all the saints. A love that is evoked or has its basis in the hope which is your treasure stored up in the heavens. Now, let's go there for a moment. Again, you're going to have to bear with me. I'm not trying to get far. I just want to introduce a couple of things with you or to you. 1 Peter chapter 1 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, it's important because this whole chapter, so much of this chapter, say it that way, is focused upon that word hope. You'll see it throughout. Because he is, he's he's approaching this with this perspective. He wants them to, to think about the expectation, the hope that has been presented to them through the gospel because the hope that has been presented to them through the gospel is the very hope that was presented to the Jew under the, under the testimony we call the law or what we call the Old Testament, but through the agency of the law, it was given to them. This hope, this expectation that God had given these people, but it was his own expectation that he was working testimonially in a people to show what he would do in the work of his final and ultimate redemption. A hope realized, his expectation fulfilled. We're going to read of that very hope in Romans chapter 8. We're talking about the, 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 the condition of the believer the condition of the soul of those born of the seed of God immediately upon that transaction taking place, immediately upon coming from death to life, from darkness to light, and we're going to read that too because he, uh, the author S. Way uses it in a way I think is very appropriate and, and points back to what we've been saying in our Romans lessons. But Peter talks about being born or begotten unto a living, lively hope or expectation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is through the one man risen and our now being joined to him by birth, being born again unto this living expectation through the resurrection of Christ. That means 
in this man, we come to the very hope of God in its living reality. We're not talking about promises. We're not talking about things that are yet to be. We are speaking of coming into a true person, a person, a living person, who is in himself the hope of God realized. Therefore, God raised him up from the dead because there's the expectation of God realized. There is God's desire throughout all of the ages made known. And by the grace of God, the mercy that he is talking about and giving giving praise for in this very chapter, his abundant mercy, that's the same as the abounding grace, the mercy of God, the love of God wherewith he has loved us, uh, that when we were dead in sin and he died for us, this is the same thing he's talking about. But that very work, the mercy of God has allowed such, such a soul to be found in the person of hope. God's hope, God's eternal expectation, his ultimate aim and intention. Then he goes on to an inheritance. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now that inheritance incorruptible goes right down to verse 23 in first. Peter chapter 1 where he says now this, this is how we've come to an incorruptible inheritance is that we are born again not of corruptible seed but of the incorruptible. Yes, that's what we've come to in Christ. An inheritance incorruptible undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. Now, he's saying there the same thing as he's saying here in Colossians. Peter is saying it. Paul is saying it here. Hope which, which is your treasure stored up in the heavens. That is not about it being one day stored up for you to one day partake of. Many co uh, commentaries say that. Many preachers preach that. That's not what he's addressing. We're going to see this hope embodied in a man in just a moment in this very chapter. So if you would allow the chapter to continue and read the context of that verse, you will see the hope he's addressing here is not some far off futuristic expectation. It is an expectation internally fulfilled through the presence of Christ. The hope which is your treasure stored up kept. He's going to say it in this letter too. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That hope, he goes on, you heard of long ago in the proclamation of the truth embodied in the gospel. This has reached you and abides with you as it does in all of the world. Meaning, it's, it, this, this gospel has spread not only to you, but all the world. He says that. I'm going to go down here. I'm not going to read every verse. It, you've read from the lips, you've heard this from the lips of Epaphras, my dear fellow bondsman. He is, as my representative, a faithful steward of the grace of the Messiah. And he it was also who told me of the love that has been kindled in you by the Holy Spirit. For this reason, I too, ever since the day I heard of you, have not ceased to pray for you. Now this is his prayer. Based upon what? Based upon being partakers of this hope. 
being recipients of hope in its full entirety. Again, we're going to talk about this hope in Romans 8. And that's going to take us into a comparison between uh, Romans 4 and Romans 8 because I think we see that picture there too in Romans 4 with Abraham. But now, according to this, Paul prays for them. And he prays that you might have, in full measure, the perfect knowledge of his will, which is an essential of all true wisdom and spiritual intelligence. I ask him that you may pass through life in a manner worthy, so as to please him entirely. I ask that in every good work you may be bearing fruit, growing higher in the perfect knowledge of God. I asked him that with all his strength you may be strengthened even to the measure of the might of his divine majesty till you attain to all enduring patience, forbearance, uh, which exalts under suffering. I asked you may ever render thanksgiving to the Father who has made us fit to have a share in the inheritance of his Saints who walk in light. How did that happen? Because we're we're talking about an inheritance. In Romans, you go into Romans 9, we're talking about an inheritance. We're talking about heirs. We're we're speaking of the very thing in this in this place. Where these men can't take the inheritance to themselves and these are left out? No, because it was always to the seed who was the heir. The heir was always the seed of promise. Not just people who were a testimony of that, but the seed himself. And the only way they could partake of the inheritance that was offered to them by God is to partake of it in the man, in the seed himself. who could only be received by faith and not. None of this could be received by works. This was a work of the grace of God. Therefore, it had to be by faith. Had to be a full thrust trusting in the sufficiency of another to be made unto us, to be within us everything that God himself promised, prophesied, all of his expectation realized. But he made us fit to be partakers of this inheritance of the saints who were enlightened. For he has rescued us from the tyranny of darkness. Remember now, throughout this study, we've been talking about the enslavement of the soul to this man or the enslavement to this man. It is an enslavement. He will say in Romans chapter 6 that when we were slaves to sin, we were therefore or thereby free from righteousness. You can't be bound to both. You are bound to one and free from the other. That's just the way it works. There cannot be this this tug of war that we are always told about in Christianity. This constant struggle between good and evil and and right and wrong and and flesh and spirit. This all this tug of war I'm always in. No. Not here. And not here. There was nothing of this man found here. And there's nothing of Adam found in Christ. Nothing. The presence of the one is the absence of the other. And that's just the fact. That's why you don't work your way into this. That's why you don't, you don't progressively work your way in. You are, by the grace of God, immediately translated from one to the other. And I love the wording here in the Arthur S. Way that we have been delivered or rescued, a good word, from the tyranny of darkness. Because it was tyranny. 
It was absolute domination of a soul to sin, death, corruption. Utterly. Entirely. And he did that. That rescue from this was through the work that transferred us into the kingdom, the rule of the son of his love, his beloved, in whom we have our ransoming, the remission of our sins. For he is the image of God, the unseen God, firstborn before all created things. In him were all things created, things in the heavens, on earth, things visible, things invisible, thrones, lordships, be they dominations, be they powers. All things through him and for him were created. And before all is he, the I am. And in him are all things knit into one whole. And he is the head of the body, the church. You see that? And in him are all things knit into one whole. Wow. Talk about the beginning and the end. Talk about the summation of everything God intended. Talk about the amen of God. There it is right there. That's the that's a statement. Knit all things into one whole. That's who he is. Ephesians says the very same thing that that uh, in the in the administration of the fullness of the times God has summed up all things both in heaven and in earth even in him in Christ in one even in him and that's the last statements regarding this the reality of our being blessed with all spiritual blessings, predestinated in him, accepted in the beloved, partakers of redemption and remission of sins, partakers of the inheritance. Why? Because we're found in the one man in whom all of these things, all of these aspects of spiritual reality have been summed up, knit together in a total package called Christ. Because those things were never intended, although maybe separately uh, presented in certain places, individually declared through many parts and pieces of the testimony. But those things, those spiritual things, those testimonial elements and words and terms and realities that they had a spiritual conclusion in mind. And they were never intended to continue to be independent little pieces and parts. And this is something that futuristic minded Christians need to understand. That, you, that the fact that you can say that we are born of God, have Christ in us, and then actually have the audacity to say, but this is coming later. This great thing is happening in the future when you have the greatest thing that has ever been on the agenda of God. And not only that, you have the thing that fulfilled the, t the entire agenda of God. You have his hope fulfilled. You have his intention realized in this man. It's all been knit together in one perfect whole, one complete package. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, who is so that in all things he might take the chief place. For in him was it God's pleasure that all of his plenitude, that's the word for fullness, should dwell. And through him was God pleased to reconcile to himself the whole of the universe through him the universe of earth the universe of heaven that's heaven and earth when he sealed their peace by the blood shed on Jesus' cross and I think that's the same picture we read in Ephesians 
chapter 2. I think he's talking more specifically of, yes, all men, but all men in Jew and Gentile. He's talking about the whole universe that was heavenly and earthly. He's talking about that, that, that division that was present in the, in the earth according to particular identifications of flesh, Jew or Gentile. But through the work of the cross, he has taken that away. He has reconciled all and brought peace by the blood shed on Jesus' cross. How do you do that right here? There's peace. See, there's peace. And you, speaking again to the church, not Jews, Gentiles, who are born of God, you who are once alienated from him, who once alike in the bent of your mind evil practices were God's enemies. See that? You're God's enemies. Why? Because this is always at odds, always at enmity, always stands in opposition to the work of God, to the intention of God. But he has reconciled to himself. You has God now reconciled to himself in his body by means of his cross. Look at this. So that now See, so read Ephesians 2 again. Go back to what we were talking about in the last lesson. That whole work, bringing peace, the reconciliation through his blood, through his cross, where he took both and put them, to the, put them on the tree. He took this man in his entirety, put it on the cross, raised up another man altogether, making peace, one man at peace with God, one man in whom none of this, none of the evil, none of the sin, none of the corruptibility remains, but one new man, a perfect man, a man of spirit, a man of life, a man of reality, a man of divine perfection. That does not define you or me, but it defines the one who lives in us, that's where reality is truly determined. We in Christianity want those terms to define us, or let's say it this way. We want to be the embodiment of those terms. We want to give external, tangible, we want to give tangibility to a spiritual reality. Paul is presenting to them a reality that is spirit and therefore unseen to natural eyes, unobservable to natural faculties, and unproducible by flesh and blood. That's why God himself had to do all of this. You, do you read of any part of this that he is saying we had a part of? Trusting, believing, yes. That's it. Only he had the sufficient tools to do the rest, to do the actual work necessary of translating us from one condition into an altogether new condition. And he did this so that he may now set you in God's presence. That's said in throughout many letters, but th listen how it's said. He may set you in God's presence set you in God's presence as before his face, holy, flawless, and irreproachable, undefiled, one would, some would say. Blameless, some would say. Holy, flawless, irreproachable. And this he will do if you do but abide in the faith. Firm founded, solid built, not staggering from the expectation born of the gospel which you heard, which has been heralded forth in the hearing of every creature under heaven. See that? What do we have to do? And this he will do 
sets you in God's presence undefiled, flawless, uh, holy, flawless, and irreproachable. If you do what? Well, there's a long list in Christianity of the requirements to meet that, to do that, to be that. And this basically has one. Abide. Continue. Just continue where you are. Abide in the faith that got you there. <laughs> Abide in this grace wherein you stand. Justified, perfect in the sight of God. Why? Because the one in the sight of God is the perfect man who just so happens to be your life. Just so happens to be the man to whom you have been married. The man to whom you have been married. I didn't mean to point to that one. Oh, yeah. And we're not going to go all through this, but let me, let me show you one thing here. This goes into where Paul will talk about this mystery, and he's saying that they have been partakers of this, uh, Arthur S. Way will call it the mystic secret, but it, the mystery, the hidden thing, that which was hidden throughout the age of the testimony. The whole thing was hidden. But he's saying that we have now been partakers of that which was at that time unrevealed, but it has now been made clear and plain to God's saints. To them was it God's will to make known what is the wealth of the glory of this mystery proclaimed among the Gentiles. That, that mystery's essence is that Messiah is living within you that's it so Christ Messiah is living within you which means for you the hope of the glorious vision of God Now, I don't like that, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the hope again. There's the hope. This is the same hope that they heard through proclaimed through the glad tidings, the, the hope that was the very basis of their love for the saints. There's the hope. Not having one to be fulfilled later in the, later in the centuries, but now... Through the just the presence of Christ. Just because the Messiah now abides by his spirit in you, you are now partakers of the very hoped for glory of God. You are partakers of hope realized, hope fulfilled. It's brought to its ultimate end, its ultimate goal in the, pre in the person of Christ who is now present in you. Now look what he says, because we talked about here just a second ago that he did all of this, the work of the cross, all of this, so that he may set us in God's presence, holy, flawless, and irreproachable. Look at this. It is his coming that I now proclaim. Yes, his coming to dwell in you. And I admonish everyone, every sinner, I instruct every hearer with all the wisdom given to me, Look at this. So that I, that I may set in God's presence every man full grown, he says. I don't like that word. I like perfect. Perfect in the new life in Messiah. Wow. Now, that's a long route to get to this. But this is what he's saying. Christ is in you, and I'm proclaiming this to whoever will hear, to the sinner that needs this life and to the saint that, the saint that possesses it, that they who do not have such will come to be found in him, and they who are found in him will have the anchoring assurance to know 
that because you are found in him, because he who is the hope of God and the glory of God realized now abides in you. You have come, one translation, the Greek, Jew, the Greek uh, no, I'm sorry, the complete Jewish Bible says you have come to the goal in the Messiah. You have come to the intention in the Messiah. He says here, I am proclaiming this that I may sit in God's presence. That's the very same thing he says at the first part here. That he may set us in God's presence holy, flawless, and irreproachable. That's what he is saying. I am, through the proclamation of the indwelling Christ, declaring to them that if he is in you and you are in him, that you have been set in this man, set, made to sit together with him, set as a restful disposition, as a disposition and a condition of total rest, you are now found in him. And being found in him, you've come to the intention, the goal, the very thing of God realized, a new life, a perfect life. Nothing needed to add to it. Nothing that could ever take away from it possibly at all, ever. It's this life that he's proclaiming. The fact that he is proclaiming that they are found in the one who stands in the presence of God, holy, flawless, and irreproachable, blameless, irrevocable, because he is the beloved one. He is the accepted of God. He is the son of his love. I'll stop there. But I want to continue on this because to me, I'm doing a poor poor job at explaining it at this point but to me he sets this stage of absolute certainty by the presence of Christ just like Romans 8 you are not of the flesh you are in the spirit you have come from death unto life you have come from the law of sin and death that, a, that was your internal condition that you could not rid yourself of you could not unbind yourself from this binding couldn't loose these chains now here found in him you are free from that internal condition because you have come to an altogether new internal condition and he's basing and, and on that sure basis, he will begin to expose and warn against and expose the the vanity of these external things that are being introduced into their midst. The external things that are being pushed upon them Because for Paul, for me, for God himself, it is the internal. It is the internal reality where reality is truly known and found. That's where it's effectual. It doesn't become effectual because I can observe it. That's where it becomes watered down. That's where it becomes, that's where it becomes a means of deception. When I think I can point at that particular observable thing, whatever it may be, and say, that is him. That is Christ. That is spiritual life. That is holy. That is righteous. No. I 
found those type of judgments. become less and less, if not totally non-existent, the more and more we see the unseen defining the unseen measure of spiritual reality. We will not be caught in the trap of defining an unseen spiritual reality and truth that is only defined in the spiritual, the man of spirit himself, Christ himself. We will not be caught defining such divine matters in the realm of flesh and blood, in the realm of flesh and works and deeds. Are you saying we shouldn't do good things? No, absolutely not. It's an absurd thought to think I'm saying that. I'm just saying that's not where reality is defined. Do good things. But guess what? People who are not in Christ do great things too. People who do not have life itself dwelling in their soul do wonderful things. Philanthropic, no doubt about it. Some of the most giving, charitable people are not born again. And I'll say as Paul does in Romans chapter 2, do we now call their charity because they're doing it and these Christians aren't? Can we now call them Christian? Say that they have this newness of life, that they are brought from darkness to light just because they do that? No. Because their external acts does not change. It does not produce, nor does it diminish, nor does it change their internal condition. I hope this is clear. God for me is defining reality in such a clear way and warning me in the midst of it. Warning me against bringing these divine realities into the earth to bring them low where I can understand them. No. Along with this high calling of God in Christ, everything that pertains to that high calling is high meaning it is above. It is spirit. It is truth. Therefore, in Colossians 3, in this very letter we're talking about today, he will say, therefore set your affection on that which is above, not on the earth. Not in the realm of tangibility, not in the realm of visible proof, because those things are deceptive. What is not deceptive is Christ in you. Because that never points the finger at anyone but him. All right. Thanks, guys, for being with us. Appreciate you listening, being out there. If you're in the Virginia area, we will be in uh, Tazewell, Virginia, the 13th, 14th, and 15th of September at uh, um, church there Peggy Carr is pastoring and we're going to have our conference there uh, some of us from here are going Brother Lumen and myself and um, maybe a couple others and we'll be there having a conference for that weekend 13th, 14th and 15th of uh, September so if you're in that area and like to join us please do so and uh, we'd love to have you. I'd love to see you there. So, amen.